bullet sub on it. Oops. Oops. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> That's okay. Um, got it. I think I have to press a button. There we go. Um, yes. Yeah, so I actually um have been working for a number of years in the cotton industry in biological control and integrated pest management. So I'm interested in predator-prey interactions. And I um, was interested in um, what could be used as part of a program to help manage the varroa mites. So um, what shall I go into what integrated pest management is? Absolutely. Start by talking about what integrated pest management is because I'm sure many of us here would like to learn what it is. Okay. So often when people have been um, trying to deal with pests is what they do is they try and annihilate them. They try, um, when they're in their crops, they try and completely get rid of them. But what can happen is that the animals then build up resistance to whatever chemicals that you're using to try and fight them. So what is a um, more comprehensive approach is to use integrated pest management. We use a number of different techniques to um, control the pests. So, and you try and use as soft as option as possible to, so, and um, this enables you to avoid using hard chemicals, which, and it also means that if you do have some very um, some strong chemicals, then the animals won't develop resistance to them. Now, I come from the cotton industry where integrated pest management has been very effective. Initially, they, they've got one major pest there. No, they've got a number of pests, but in particular, um, Helicoverpo is a mean pest of cotton, and um, it nearly destroyed the industry. So in 1999, they'd been using all sorts of nasty chemicals against it, and every time Helicoverpo developed resistance after eight years, they get another one. And um, in the end, they they couldn't, they were just spraying so much they couldn't make money. So they had developed some tools um, that weren't involving chemicals. So they used that in conjunction with um, um, modifying the genetics of the of the crop, BT cotton, so that um, the if the caterpillar eats it, then it dies. Um, but and so they used all these in conjunction. Now um, BT cotton overseas, the heater converters developed resistance to that as well. So by using a combination of techniques, you're able to control it. And um, so now um, cotton is very profitable and effective. So um, what we're trying to do um, with our project is we're trying to look for what softer options could be available to help with the management of um, varroa mites. So varroa mites are like helicoverpera in that they're very effective at developing to resistance to any chemicals you throw at them. And what's and this is what has happened overseas, to, um, that the, the varroa mite has developed resistance to a number of different chemicals that have been used. So what we're interested in is trying to find out what, what other techniques could be around that we could use to control uh, Varroa mites and what could be adaptive for, new, for the um, Australian situation. Now, with um, integrated pest management, it's not just your toolkit, it's not just what techniques you have, but it's also how you use them. So it's really important to have a really good network and a connection between growers and also support from the industry so that the best techniques and what's relevant to different situations can actually get out to the beekeepers. What's also really important is monitoring. So all the different monitoring techniques to know how um, whether your techniques are working, whether what level of varroa mite infestation you have, because that will also determine what can affect, um, what would be a suitable technique to use. Mm. So it's, um, it's, it's got a number of different aspects um, to it. Um, I'm not sure I've done a good job explaining it, but um, this is, yeah. So, yeah, so what we're looking at is trying to find new techniques that could be adaptive, adapted to the Australian situation and we want them to use it 
um, to, and we want to be able to use them within a system that maintains them and is most effective. I know, uh, Mary, when we were speaking with Juliana, she she was quite excited about being involved in this project. And I suppose it's because Varroa is an emerging pest here in Australia. So the lessons that could be learnt from America, um, I, I, I'm guessing, are a part of this research project. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned from the American experience of Varroa mite? Well, what we've learned from America is how they're destructive they are, how you know, I think they're destroying 30% of all hives every year. Um, and what we're, and also that they develop resistance really is readily. So those are the things we've learned from Australia. What we've, we've also got um, colleagues that we're working with from New Zealand, such as um, um, James Salisbury and um, Mark Goodwin. And Mark Goodwin was um, very was right at the forefront of when Varroa arrived in New Zealand. And what they tried to do is they tried to get um, some of these other options available um, to the beekeepers in New Zealand. So they had workshops and they um, told them all about the different techniques. But the trouble was that um, the people learned about these different techniques but didn't really have a way of how to use how to integrate them how to use them when to use them which is this whole thing about um for integrated pest management to work it has to be within a framework and you have to have a lot of support for people so that they can um they've got someone they can call to ask about what do i do in this situation and so that they can be more effectively used to um integrated together so from new zealand it really showed that it's not just the toolkit, it's the structure and how how you how you use it. And mm -hmm. um from it, um the US, it's just how mean this beastie can be. Mm. So that's a really interesting point that you make. I'm just making some notes here, Mary, but you're talking about the toolkit and the structure. Um mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting because often it's just assumed that, you know, people will just know what to do, that if we have the research, then we just, we give it to the people and they can just do it. Um, New Zealand's shown that's not the case. Um, and obviously here in Australia, we're still in an extermination phase with Varroa mite. So in terms of your research, um, what, what, what can you tell us about when those toolkits and frameworks would start to to happen and occur in an Australian context? Okay, so what we're doing is a scoping study. So what we're doing is that we're trying to put a, a net spread far and wide on what options are out there. And then we will bring those back in, have a look at what those, um, what could be developed for Australia. And then we are also interested in what the, um, in the beekeeping industry and how we could work with them to support them in um, uh, getting the best um, the best approach out to the beekeepers. Now, another aspect that we need to consider that is that in Australia we have such different climates, and we have different types of beekeepers. So you have your commercial ones, your um, your hobbyists, and then your um, Forgot the term that people use for the people who do it part time. Are they part timers? Is that what? Uh, okay. recre uh, recreational beekeepers. I know that's the term we like to use in Tasmania. Right. Um, a hobby, a uh, commercial, small scale. Yeah, um, that's. The but you've got different. So, like a person who's only got one or two hives can spend more time on their hive and do different sort of actions to what somebody who's got a thousand hives can do. So mm -hmm. there will need to be some modification depending, you know, what techniques different people can use because of that. Mm -hmm. So um, at this stage, we don't, um, I'm not sure, I don't think I can answer that question very clearly on when yeah. we would have a structure in place. We're just trying to get get things together mm -hmm. and to, um, we're doing the initial steps so that if, it does become established in Australia. We have um, a system ready to go. I know, Mary, that um, when I spoke with you yesterday, um, you mentioned that you had recently attended the New South Wales Beekeepers Conference. Um, yeah. This, what was the feeling on the ground amongst beekeepers there? Concern. 
Yeah. There was a lot of concern, I would yeah. say, from the beekeeping conference. There was a lot of, um, there were a number of talks about varroa mites and um, about the um, efforts that have been put in to control the outbreak. Um, there was some, an excellent talk by a guy called um, Sammy Randall. He's this phenomenal speaker who came over from the US who talked about um, how Burrow might operate. And that was some, um, he was very entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, yeah, it was, uh, I found it very interesting and um, very engaging. I really enjoyed that conference. It was excellent. Yeah, that's good because, you know, your work, once you've done this scoping work for the framework, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be the port of call once, you know, biosecurity decide the extermination's over. And if it does get a hold, what do we do next? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be part of that. I think mm. there's other people also who would be relevant in that conversation, very much so. People working on um, um, breeding for, the, for bees as we speak, people working on um, monitoring techniques respect to breeding, I'm thinking Nadine, Nadine Chapman, she's done some work on that. And um, yeah, there was a, an interesting paper on monitoring as well, using DNA analysis and things like that in the environment. So that, yeah, we'll, we'd be part of the team. Mm. Um, now, I did have another question to ask you about um, monitoring, but I've just lost that question. Um, let me just go back to my, my list in here. Um, that's what I was going to ask you about was the article that you published last year as well um, because you've uncovered that the pseudoscorpion predates on varroa mite now that's a really interesting article that you shared with me a few weeks ago which I've shared with people here um, and in the article you mentioned that pseudoscorpions do live in Tasmania um, yes. and you also ask in the article for people to record whether they see pseudoscorpions around their hives. So I'm very interested to have a chat about pseudoscorpions. I, our president last night said to us, um, I've been looking in my hive for them, Jenny, and I haven't seen any. And I thought, well, you're probably not going to see them in the hive. So can you tell us about them? Um, and also tell us what kind of environment they live in and perhaps a little bit about how that they would be used as part of an integrated pest management system. Because I know that when I've spoken with people about pseudoscorpions since reading your article, they've been sending me these YouTube videos of um, different places around America that I think in the States they have pseudoscorpions and different parts of the world and how to breed them and how to care for them. Um, so yeah, a lot of questions in that one question, but would love to hear your response to that. Okay. Right, so um, it's um, Calipher cancroides seems to be the best um, candidate at the moment for um, maybe controlling varroa mites with um, predators. With um, Now, they um, are quite ferocious predators of varroa mites. Um, they really attack them, and um, they are common around the world, the cosmopolitan. They haven't been reported from mainland Australia, but they have been reported from Tasmania. It's quite likely they're in mainland Australia, but they haven't been reported here. They not only um, would hang out in um, your hive, but they could also hang out um, in chook pens and things like that. So if you were looking for them in your hive, I'd probably, um, probably on the bottom tray would be a good place to look. They um, they would probably like to hide in crevices and things like that. They're quite small, or they're about the length of a bee head. If um, um, but they they are pretty fierce. Even the little babies will attack the varroa mites. So but how do they? Um, I was just yeah. going to ask Mary. Just sorry to interrupt, but how do they do that? Like I've been trying to imagine how they do that without harming the bee, or the bee harming the pseudoscorpion. I think the best they, well, this is one of the challenges that we have with managing varroa mites is that you need to be able to attack it when it's in the brood chamber, as well as when it's walking around trying to find bees and when it's on bees. So these guys are mainly only, these guys are most effective when the varroa mites are walking around. That's when they can attack them. So they would have to, I don't think they'd be, um, so I think they would need to be used in conjunction with other methods as well. 
the person who's done the most work with these guys is a New Zealander called Ron Van Tor. And he's done quite a lot of work with the um, Califacancroides. And he sees them as being useful in, um, in um, conjunction with some other techniques, like methods of knocking varroa mites off as the bees enter the hive. So then they're, then they're, out, then they're off the bees and then the, um, the cancroides can attack them before they get back up or cause any more trouble. So there's, um, they'd probably be best used in conjunction with something else. Maybe, um, but this is the sort of thing that you'd want to check out. Um, so we'd be looking to um, talk to him more. I have talked to some people and some people say, oh, no, not so useful. And other people say, oh, no, it's really good. So um, I, think it's, I think it's something worth exploring. There, um, yeah, there are some, in other types of bees, there are animals that do live with them that do help to um, maintain, that are pos um, positive in the colony. But in um, honeybees, they're not so much. So it's, um, we'll just, it's, it, it needs to be explored more. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, of course. Um, oh, yeah. and if you do find them, they need to. You need to talk to Mark Harvey. He is the pseudo scorpion expert. He's on our team, and he's in Western Australia. So, um, yeah, you need we. Need, and I think that's on that article that I sent you, Mark Harvey. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's got his email is there, and his phone number is there. So you take a picture of your mic and you send it off and yeah. if you can get hold of it put in a plastic bag and stick it in the freezer in case it is something really interesting and useful um i've got i do have the article so i'll make sure i share it um, when i share this link with everybody as well so they can um, refer to it as well mary um mary so in terms of your integrated pest management framework that you're putting together is it well funded into the future um, and do you think that Australia could be a leader in terms of finding the answers and the solutions to the varroa mite problem? I think Australia is really well positioned for being able to crack this because it can learn from all the other countries that have already had this beast. And I think that if we if it, if we and this started with an integrated pest management approach, then that is our best chance of keeping on top of it because you're main, keeping your powder dry basically on some of the stronger chemicals. So if you, in case you need them, and it also means that you're also not contaminating your hive and your honey and your honey products with these other chemicals. Yeah. And um, I feel very lucky to be working with people who have had experience of Ferrara and what 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 has actually happened overseas, and so we can really learn from them. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm thinking very much of um, you know, Juliana, Mark, and um, James yeah. in that respect. Yeah, what so you, I yeah, think it could be a really, I think it's a really good opportunity to really get what on. Yeah, and I think that what you've just said is also made me think about the challenges that perhaps you face or um, governments will face lobby groups from chemical companies who will be seeing an opportunity to make money uh, rather than perhaps approaching it from an IPM perspective. Is that something that as researchers you worry about or that you've seen happen before? Um, I know I'm going off track with our questions here, but you're unlocking all these really interesting thoughts. So I'm, I apologise for that, Mary. But yeah, um, is, it, is it something that has a precedent? Um, it's a, I think it's really important that um, within an industry that if you were trying to undertake an integrated pest management approach, that you have extension offices that are not funded by chemical companies. I mm. think it's important that they're funded from within the industry. Um, sometimes it's a combination like with DPI and with other bodies. But I think that that's um, important. So what that means then is that they can, they're, um, it's basically quite a cooperative, um, it's uh, everybody's pulling together to try and do what's best for the industry. And you're trying to think, well, what, what is going to be most effective in this case, rather than be pushing a, a perspective. And yeah. um, 
you want, it's very important to get as much information out and also to get feedback back to make mm. sure that what, um, what you've studied and what you think will work and the situation actually is working, that's really important to get the, the flow of information is super important. And um, again, support for beekeepers as well. But I think that needs to be and, um, from within the industry if at all possible. And that's the most effective when it's like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mary, for that. Um, I'm just, I'm conscious of the time and I want to make sure there's enough time for people to ask questions. Um, I know, Mary, when I was speaking to you leading into this interview, we talked about uh, your, we usually ask five questions about beekeeping, but I do know that you're a stingless beekeeper. And yeah. I suppose, and I haven't actually mapped these questions out for you. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about your stingless bees before I open the floor to questions uh, for questions. Um, now, stingless bees, are they affected by varroa mite? No, they're too little. They're, they're teeny tiny. They're like, my goodness, compared to bees and monsters. You know, normal honeybees are monsters against these guys, and yeah. they're um and can insert in respect to the amount of honey that they produce. It's pathetic. You know, mm -hmm. bees, yeah. honeybees make what is it, fifty liters a year, and these little guys, you might get one liter out of them. So they're um the one I um I live in um inland New South Wales in um Narrabri, which is a long way. It actually was a hot spot, one of the inland hot spots. Um, and my the so the honeybees that I have are uh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So it is Ostoplebia australis, Ostoplebia australis, and um, I regard them as little prima donnas really because they won't get out of bed before ten o'clock. Has to be warm enough, you know. If it's chilly, they won't bother. And if there's not any decent um, flowers around, they won't bother. I don't know, um, they put a little, they have a little opening, they put a little lace net over their opening and that they, they uh, when they go to sleep at night, which is quite cool. Oh, no. And they, yeah, and they're, and they're really chilled too. Like I try- They're hanging out inside until 10 o'clock in the morning, they're, you know, late night drinking margaritas, go and hang <laughs> out in the morning, cruise around, open the lace curtain, go out and get some nectar, come back home, sleep again, you know. Yeah, well, I like um, supermodels. They're like supermodels who <laughs> won't get out of bed. <laughs> and they, um, and they're so chill. I mm -hmm. like, um, I was there, I, I, I got their honey and there were some guys just sort of hanging around the edge of the honey pot and I didn't take too much because I was worried about them so I just scooped out a little bit of honey in the middle of the honey section and um because I'm a real novice at this but the guys were just hanging around chill they didn't they weren't upset or anything and then I put it all back and <laughs> so yeah they're they're pretty cool beasts I didn't and I didn't realize that you were in the one of the red zones for Varroa and I'm I know there's been a lot of talk about Fipronil baiting that's happening has that impacted your bees or anybody's bees in your area that you know about I was worried about that mm. but um no, these guys also don't travel very far oh, they're they lazy I forgot <laughs> they're, they're tight. well they're little all we things they're maybe 800 meters I think um yeah because yeah, so if you're trying to use them like for example macadamia to um pollinate is much much harder than with the honeybees because they don't travel so far yeah mm. but yeah so um I was concerned about that but mm. they um they haven't been affected thank goodness touch wood oh, and, they, and um I when I talked to some people about it they said oh they it would be unlike very unlikely mm. that they would be affected yeah yeah that's good um and so what made you interested in native stingless bees versus keeping European honeybees? Um, well, I've always wanted to have bees, but my husband was allergic to them, so I couldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't know. And uh, I, then I thought, well, I'll try natives. And also um, I got some, I have a fireplace. You know, we have we have wood fire in Narrabri. Mm. And I, one of my pieces of wood very sadly had a part of a colony in it and I tried to revive it and 
keep it going and it didn't didn't work so in the end I uh, so I thought well I'll I'll try and grow have some myself so I bought some from um Queensland yeah. some Australia and so I feel like I've redeemed myself <laughs> all those poor wee bees that were in my wood when um yeah so that's um yeah so that's how I got hold of them and Australia is suit is inland because yeah. we have such more extreme so we have frost as well as really hot days so the guys can t cope with it whereas yeah. I think it's Trigonium is the one that's mainly along the coast, coast yeah. which it doesn't occur where I am I don't think it is mm. it doesn't the conditions are too harsh I don't mm. know if Australia it it does deal with frost you know it does handle the cold because it it, it but it, it goes for extremes but you if I don't know if it would get hot enough it could handle the cold but whether it'd be hot enough for them to actually get out and do some work <laughs> well they might be sleeping till midday then you know <laughs> they'll be having a lovely time thank you very much <laughs> Yeah, you might have to put lots of flowers around them. <laughs> now, Mary, you've had a chat about, you talked a little bit about um, the research. We've talked a little bit about the article that you published in 2020, or went out oh, on sorry in 2022. About this. This is my room. The oh, that's all right. The sensor light, you need to move a bit more. Yeah. Um, Oh, now I've lost my track of thought. This is terrible. I'm losing my train of thought tonight. Um, you've talked about the varroa mite. You've talked about... Uh... Now oh, my the goodness. incursion. So, it wasn't uh, about the incursion, but you talk about the incursion. Okay. Please do. Yeah, yeah no, I've been um, I've been really impressed with how, how they've gone about that. I think that has been really thorough and yes. um, they've been really dedicated. And there's a lot of people involved who love bees who have really suffered having yeah. to do this work, but it's for the greater good. And I feel yeah. that I'm I'm very impressed with how, how they've gone about it. Mm. So now they're up to um, checking the, trying to eradicate the wild bees in these areas as well. Mm. And that seems to be going well, but um, it's, um, yeah, so I think yeah, so I've been impressed with how it's done. If they can keep it out, I think that's better. I hope can. it can happen. Well, if, if they did keep it out, we'd be the first continent in the world, wouldn't we? The first country in the world to be able to keep it out once yeah, an incursion so starts. I was in Antarctica. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would so, yeah. That's I think we're the last. Yeah. yeah. Um. And with regards to your research, and um, we will be sharing how people can record um, if they see see uh, pseudoscorpions where they are. Um, is is there a way that people can find you or reach out to you or find yeah. more about your research? What's what's the best way, Mary? Um, well, I'm at, I've, there's my email. They could reach out to me on my email, Mary Whitehouse at mq edu au. Yeah. Um, and we, um, if they, we're very interested in beekeepers' perspective on, um, uh, well, what what the beekeeping industry is like. So we're trying to gather some information on that to be able to tailor how to approach um, on to be able to tailor IPM approaches. So um, I can give you a um, QR code that people could link on. If they want right. to fill out, if they want to give us, it's just a short form on if they're on their beekeeping interests and how they how that works. So we mm. can um, that would be really nice as well to get information mm. on the to get a nice feel for the industry to tailor um, what approaches would be best in different parts of the industry. That would so be that's great as well. So I can send you the QR code for that. That would be wonderful. Then I can share that with the link as well for people to um, to scan and, and sign up for that as well. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, what I might do, I know we've got a, a few people on the line today. I might just open the floor up for questions. I've asked all the questions I wanted to and I actually went off script. So I apologise to you, Mary, for that because a lot of the questions I asked tonight 
were like, oh, that's an interesting thing you've just raised. Um, but I certainly don't want to take up all of the time talking. I'd really love to hear questions from the floor because I'm sure I know we've got people from Victoria here, people from Sydney, New South Wales, Tasmania. Um, yeah, the floor is yours, people, to ask for this opportunity. I'm sure, Carla, you've got questions. Don't know if she has. You can see Charles Connors made a comment. I'm sure you've got a question, Carla, but it looks like our pseudo scorpions are cave dwellers in the Mole Creek area. That's interesting. Thanks, Charles, for that. Yeah, I didn't know that, but that's interesting. There's a, a lot of different types of some pseudo scorpions, mm. and so and Mark Harvey is our is the Australian if not world expert on them. So, thank you. I reckon Carla's got a question. Only because he called me out, Jen. <laughs> I'll think of one really quickly. Look, I haven't done any reading really in the last six months on this. What? How could we encourage habitat for the pseudoscorpions in our hives? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> there could be, um, I think... I did, what I'd want to do is talk to Ron to get that information more accurate for you. Um, they, I, I think that they like, um, what you can do is have smaller crevices for them, but then there's the problem of small hive beetles as well. I think I'd have to get back to you to get you better information on that. The, that was something we pondered just today about how would that go encouraging pseudoscorpions without encouraging small uh, hive beetle in, in the Victorian situation. Yeah. No, um, they, I, I can ask Ron. So what I can do, they will write that down. Or I could do more reading. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm being I, lazy. No, it's all right. I should have, I should have had that more on my fingertips now. I don't know. There we go. Right. Um, okay. I'll I'll ask Ron and get back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Carla. Looks like Vicky might have a question as well. Hi, yeah. Vicky. I hope you can hear me. It's good to see you again. You um, I remember when I first started Sydney Bee Club, which was about a decade ago, we watched a short video on pseudoscorpions and varroa. And I was really impressed at the time because I think when the pseudoscorpions do attack the varroa, the only thing left is like their little legs. And I was, <laughs> is that true? I think like, I mean, it was so long ago. That, and I've never oh. really about it until now and so when you said they're very voracious and they really do go for the varroa um what is it that they're attacking are they attacking their kind of because you know the varroa has very small legs at the beginning do they attack them as like a a, a major food source and 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 part of that video was saying and i wish that it had come to fruition as you said before that there was a you know their system put in place because they were saying you, you know in the future, you'd be able to buy boxes of pseudoscorpions and put them into your beehive type thing to be able to treat varroa. But this was about a decade ago. And I'm just wondering when you were saying um, it's getting the toolkit, it's actually getting the system in place for beekeepers to use, would that be kind of the idea is that you would buy a package of pseudoscorpions and then put them in your beehive? Or would you be thinking, to encourage pseudoscorpions to the beehive? Like what what systems are there actually? Because I'm sorry, I haven't read your paper yet. Oh, that's all right. I haven't, I, I was just a very um, light paper on just trying to see if they're out there here in Australia. Um, mm. No, well, I think that what you'd probably do is bot would be to get some on board and put them in the hives. I think it would probably suit best small group people. Um, you know, people with one or two hives would probably be the one I would, I would um, align that system with. Um, and I need to talk to Ron. I need to get the detail better from Ron. So he has been managing his hives with um, pseudoscorpions. So he uses pseudoscorpions and a technique to knock the mites off into the hive. So they knock them off and then the pseudoscorpions eat them. One of the challenges with using the pseudoscorpions is they prefer it a bit cooler 
than hive temperatures, so they tend to be lower down. And so they can clean up um, varroa mites, but how effective they are at actually destroying them among within the hive is more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, but they don't seem to be attacking the actual brood or anything like that. So that's a good thing. But um, that I don't think they'd be effective on their own at this stage. Yeah. So I would just I would I would think that at least initially you would um, buy boxes of them if they turn to be effective under some situations. Yeah, I was always hoping that that would be the way that by the time Varroa came to Australia, that we would have had an integrated pest management system, as you're talking about. Unfortunately, it hasn't. It's not the case, and it uh, you know we do have an incursion without. Yeah a natural system to be able to control it. Um, I was just wondering, is it, I've, I've heard um, another researcher once talk that pseudoscorpions actually do travel with swarms as well. And, and it's one of my favorite facts. Video, about it. Have you seen it on the internet? It is so cool. Getting ready to swarm and they kind of, it's like taking, like they're riding a horse or you know, that the bees are taking their dog with them or something like that. Like there's such, yeah. They cohabit so well that even when they swarm, they they wish to take them with them. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that what that I think there's um I'm there are a number of different bee species, and the other bee species are more likely to have um, commensals with them to have associate um to look after other animals that help actually maintain hive mm -hmm. hygiene than the honeybee. So that is more common among other bee species. Pretty um, cute. It is very cute. Um, so I'm not sure if honeybees themselves do that, but other bee species do. So this is um, this is one of the challenges we have with high, with honeybees is that they've been so focused on making a lot of honey <laughs> that some of these other traits that um, uh, aren't, aren't there as they are in other species. So that would be something that would be interesting to see whether honeybees, whether honeybees, that species themselves actually take the varro, um, the, um, the scorpions with them and they leave or not. That would be interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, oh, there's something else you said that I, um, um, that I thought was, um, relevant oh that's it yeah so what your point was about how we, you thought that IPM would be developed by now and this is one of the problems is that IPM is a really is a, is difficult to actually establish because it's more complicated than just spraying something out and that's why it's not just the toolkit it's also industry support and monitoring so there's it's not just the toolkit, it's actually the whole network around it and monitoring as mm. well with the pests that you're wanting to control. Mm. I, thought, I was at that conference as well last week, which was quite interesting. I think it was last week. Time gets away from yeah, me. Um, and Dr. Samuel Ramsey, and he had that great yeah. talk discovered that Varroa fed on the fatty deposits of the bee and not the actual blood as such. But it was yeah. also his talk, um, how he was, because they do feed on, um, you know, deposits from the liver in the bee's body that, you know, introducing a pathogen to bees would then maybe come transferred to the varroa to be able to then control their behaviour. Would that be kind of as, would that be called an integrated pest management using a pathogen that travels through the bee's body that the varroa then feed on? Was that, would that, I guess that's kind of that's using. part of it, yeah. The, eat nature instead of just bombing them with chemicals? Yeah. Um, integrated pest management um, means that you're incorporating a number of different methods. So biological control um, um, is just one method and there's all different types of biological control. So you can have predators, you can have pathogens like that and that's another biological control agent. So there's all, you're actually trying to use a whole lot of different ways as well as um, um, physical different physical things that you need to do to try and manage these things like knocking the mites or that's a physical barrier but it's still a technique that would be useful so there's a number but but 
it's even with, but in integrated pest management, you can still use um, by um, by pesticides or even pesticides if if you get to that, if you have to. So it's not that you never use other things; it's that you try to avoid them and try and integrate it. The ideal is when the system is humming and working nicely without the need for major intervention. But sometimes, sometimes it's just necessary. Sometimes it happens. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Vicky. Are there any other questions from anybody listening in? Last chance to ask a question to Mary before we close up. It's like all questions are done. Um, well, thank you very much, both Carla and Vicky, for your questions from the floor. And thank you so much, Dr. Whitehouse, for joining us today to talk about integrated pest management. I know that it's something that's the concept is a new and complex one for me to wrap my head around. So I'm looking forward to doing more reading and more research, watching more videos. In fact, Vicky, that sounds like an amazing video with the, you know, the pseudoscorpions riding the bee. Um, so I'll go looking for that one as well. I haven't seen that one. So um, just want to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Um, and Mary, thank you so much. And I will be interviewing next month. Um, a young man from Ireland, which I will keep secret for the moment, but we'll be sharing on the internet in the next weeks, few weeks. So thank you everyone for coming.